Welcome to the Nerve Surgeon Channel. This is the talk on the management of adult traumatic brachial plexus injury. My name is Dominic Power and I'm a peripheral nerve surgeon. The brachial plexus is the junction between the nerves in the upper limb and the spinal cord in the brain. Sensory signals are carried through the peripheral nerves up to the spinal cord level and nociceptive stimulation can result in a reflex pathway for withdrawal with a motor command coming immediately without ascending fibres up to the brain. More often than not though, these sensory inputs come through the dorsal root ganglion across the spinal cord and then travel up through the spinal cord, the brain stem and midbrain nuclei up to the sensory motor cortex. And this allows the brain to process the information, localise any sensory input, but also the pathways through the midbrain allow a neural endocrine response. Um, and also activation of the reticular activating system is a response for increased awareness and protection and prevention of further injury. Now the brain processes this information from a number of our senses. Taste, smell, sight, hearing and touch. And we can imagine what it's like to lose most of these senses. Imagine a heavy cold, shutting our eyes or wearing noise cancelling headphones. But unless you've had a peripheral nerve injury, it's impossible to imagine what it's like to lose the sense of touch. Sense is integral to what makes us human. Sensation is transmitted up through the peripheral nerves, through the brachial plexus, into the spinal cord and up to the brain where it's processed. So the hand is our organ of sense and it's positioned on the end of a mobile but stable arm that allows us to explore our environment. The sensory homunculus is the representation of the hand on the sensory cortex in the brain and it shows how important the hand is and how integral it is to our sense of touch. Now because of this importance of the hand, we use it for everything in day-to-day -day life. The hand can be used for nutrition, vocation, recreation, protection, occupation, and also to express emotion and is involved in showing for affection and for procreation. This junction between the peripheral nerves and the brachial plexus is a very delicate one. There are little rootlets, ventral and dorsal, that allow respectively motor outflow and sensory inflow into the spinal cord. And these rootlets, ventral and dorsal, come together and form the spinal nerve root, which exits from its bony protection within the spinal canal out into the upper limb in the posterior triangle of the neck. And this is the roots of the brachial plexus. So sensory input comes in from the periphery. A reflex arc can allow immediate withdrawal, but ascending and descending fibers, providing sensory input to the brain and many inhibitory downward uh, commands from the brain allow us to control this movement. And as we've already mentioned, the arm is hugely mobile and yet stable, and this allows the arm to be positioned in space. And so it's extremely important that the junction between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system is flexible, strong, robust, and resistant to injury or to traction injury. Now we learn the brachial plexus in this way. We think about the roots of the brachial plexus, the C5 to T1 roots, coming together to form the upper, middle and lower trunks, and each of these dividing into anterior and posterior divisions, which then come together to form the lateral, medial and posterior cords, named by their relationship to the axillary artery. And then branches from these cords result in the peripheral nerves that we're more used to talking about. But it's wrong to think about the brachial plexus in this way. The brachial plexus is part of a network of nerves from the base of the skull down towards the thorax. Indeed, the C345 have contributions to the phrenic nerve. The C2 to C4 can innervate the uh, strap muscles and also outflow to the supraclavicular nerves. And then there's outflow from T1, which is a sympathetic innervation that goes up to the head and the neck. So it's more complex than one would imagine when 
one thinks just about the brachial plexus in terms of its anatomical descriptions in medical textbooks. But fortunately, there's a degree of organisation. From C5 down to T1, there is almost a sector organisation such that C5 controls shoulder abduction and external rotation, C6 elbow flexion, C7 elbow extension, C8 finger flexion, and T1 delicate intrinsic muscle function within the hand. And there's also a, nat a natural organisation of the dermatomal stimulation, uh, st um, dermatomal innervation of the upper limb. And this is due to the development of the embryonic limb bug. So C5 provides the outer shoulder innervation down to the lateral elbow. C6, dorsal and volar aspects of the forearm on the radial side. C7, a small area to the middle finger. C8, the on the border of the hand. T1 around the elbow and T2, lateral branch of the intercostal second nerve supplied the auxiliary and upper medial arm skin. Also, as we move from medially to laterally, there is some, there's some natural um, anatomical distribution as well. In the periphery, we're used to thinking about a peripheral nerve injury, be it a radial nerve injury, a median nerve injury, or ulnar nerve injury. And at the root level, we're used to thinking about nerve root compression, perhaps from a disc lesion. C5 being compressed could result in weakness of shoulder abduction and external rotation. But in between these, we also have to think in terms of the anatomy of the trunks, divisions and cords. And this is where it gets extremely complicated. So for instance, the lateral cord would supply not only the musculocutaneous nerve for elbow bend, but also the lateral head of the median nerve, as well as the lateral pectoral nerve. The medial cord would contribute to the ulnar nerve, the medial cutaneous nerve of arm and forearm, but also the medial head of the median nerve. So the first thing I'm going to talk about in terms of defining brachial plexus injury is the anatomical site of injury, and then we'll talk about the pathophysiological grade. And understanding these two allows the examiner to then predict the pattern determine whether or not intervention is needed and plan reconstruction. So the two common patterns that we talk about are the supraclavicular injury. This means above the clavicle and this involves the roots or the trunks of the brachial plexus. And the next main group is the infraclavicular lesion, so below the clavicle. And this is where we see the divisions, the cords and the peripheral branches being involved. The supraclavicular lesion is normally traction associated with shoulder depression, sometimes extension, and lateral neck flexion to the contralateral side. Many of these injuries are high energy and are associated with significant impacts. So for instance, in this case, the head hits the ground and the shoulder and the head are pushed in opposite directions and there is a traction injury to the upper trunk. So the types of injuries that we see are avulsion, where those delicate connections between the brachial plexus and the spinal cord are ruptured. The rootlets are pulled away from the spinal cord and this injury is medial or proximal to the dorsal root ganglion. And it's termed an avulsion injury because there is no connection between the brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system. At the bottom is a nerve rupture. And this is just like a peripheral nerve injury. The nerve is stretched and torn so that the connective tissue elements of the nerve, termed the nerve sheath, and the axons are disrupted. But this can be reconstructed in the same way as any peripheral nerve injury with adequate debridement and grafting. And the outcome depends on whether there's a concomitant proximal injury that's not been recognised, the degree of apoptosis, the degree of scarring within the nerve, and the cell population remaining, and the site of injury. And in between, there are these stretch injuries. Stretch injuries mean that the nerve sheath may be in continuity to some degree. There could be epineural continuity, or there may indeed be endoneural continuity. And in some rare cases, there may even be continuity of the, um, the ind individual endoneural tubes within the fascicles. The potential for recovery depends on whether those axons that have been snapped or ruptured internally have a scaffold to direct their regeneration. So if the endoneural tube is preserved, 
they can regenerate effectively and well, finding their original targets. Once the perineurium is disrupted, it's much harder for these nerves to navigate through the zone of injury, and the neuroma continuity is more likely. So the common patterns that we talk about in the supraclavicular nerve injury are C5 avulsion, C5-6 avulsion, upper trunk ruptures, C5-6-7, isolated C7 and T1, and the devastating pan plexus injury. And for the purposes of an exam for orthopedics or plastic surgery, I tend to term the C5 avulsion and the C5-6 avulsion, or the upper trunk rupture, as a bad shoulder in good hand function. If C7 is involved as well, there's sometimes bad shoulder and elbow function with a loss of elbow flexion and elbow extension, uh, but good hand function. Isolated C8 and T1 avulsion is a lower plexus injury, and there's usually good shoulder function retained and bad hand function. And in the pan plexus injury, everything is damaged, so it's a bad shoulder and a bad hand. And it's a useful guide when seeing one of these patients in a clinic or in an exam. The infraclavicular lesion is much more complex. It's often associated with traction, fractures and dislocations around the shoulder girdle. The clavicle may be fractured, injuring the nerves, rarely rib fractures, and occasionally extension injuries of the shoulder joint resulting in rupture of the nerves. And this example is a open clavicle fracture. It's actually traveled back through the brachial plexus rupturing the lateral and the posterior cords. So you can see the force of injury as this bone end has caused this direct laceration injury to the brachial plexus. But we also see other mechanisms of injury. This is a blast injury with fragmentation wounds through the shoulder, with disruption of the posterior circumflex humeral artery and the auxiliary nerve, also associated with a soft tissue damage and a bony injury. A high velocity gunshot wound with a bullet traversing the neck of the scapula causing a comminuted fracture and then disruption of the auxiliary nerve. Now, Narakis, one of the fathers of brachial plexus surgery, talked about the seven rules of 70%. This is a rough guide and it's useful to think about how brachial plexus injuries happen. So 70% are due to road traffic collisions and 70% are motorcycles. 70% of patients will have multiple injuries, 70% of the lesions are supraclavicular, and of these, 70% will have at least one root avulsion. 70% of the avulsions will involve the lower plexus, and 70% of root avulsions will leave the patient with chronic lifelong pain. Now, classifications of the brachial plexus are only useful if they describe the prognosis or give you an indication of how the nerve should be reconstructed. There is a classification by Lefer which talks about open and closed injuries, and the closed can be supraclavicular or infraclavicular. Type 3 injuries are radiation and type 4 obstetric, A, B and C, so herbs, predominantly shoulder involvement, B, clumpy, predominantly hand involvement, C, A, T, 1, and C, a mixed injury. I revised this classification back in 2005, and we talked about open injuries as being stabbing, low-velocity gunshot and high-velocity gunshot blast, or significant trauma. And this is to provide some sort of prognostic information about the chances or otherwise of meaningful recovery. Closed injuries can be supraclavicular, upper, lower and pan plexus, and infraclavicular, one, two or three cord injuries. Pathological lesions can be iatrogenic. Usually these are reconstructable. They may be from traction, direct injury with diathermy burns, drills, or uh, laceration or compression from retractors. Radiation and malignancy. And then, of course, there's the obstetric, as originally described in the first classification. Now, it's not possible to talk about brachial plexus injuries unless the listener has some understanding of what is a peripheral nerve injury. And so we'll have a little bit of an aside here. I do have separate talks on peripheral nerve injury. But to all intents and purposes, we term brachial plexus injuries um, and describe them in the same way as we would a peripheral nerve injury. So Seddon described a neuropraxia. So the nerve has a axon intact, but for some reason it can't carry conduction through the damaged segment. And this may be due to ischemia, edema within the nerve or demyelination. And it's not a degenerative lesion, so there's no Wallerian degeneration. Axon axontomesis results in axonopathy, 
uh, so effectively the axon is ruptured or damaged. And this would then be degraded distal to the site of injury, reabsorbed through macrophage activity, and then the sprouting proximal axonal stump can regenerate, which takes some time, and it requires an intact endoneural tube or some form of basement membrane to follow. And so axonal injuries were described by Seddon, but Sunderland uh, broke them down to talk about how much damage there was within the nerve, whether it was just the axon, whether the endoneurium was also involved or also the perineurium. So in a severe case with intact epineurium, but disruption of the perineurium, a neuroma in continuity will form. And neurontomesis is effectively the same thing. No functional continuity of the nerve, nor potential for recovery or a transection of the nerve. Now, these axontomesis and neurontomesis injuries are termed degenerative because Wallerian degeneration has happened. And this is the easiest classification, and this is the neurophysiological classification, non-degenerative versus degenerative. Degenerative lesions, the muscle fibrillates, there are positive sharp waves, and as the axon regenerates, there'll be polyphasic responses. In a non-degenerative lesion, none of these changes will occur, and the muscle will not have increased spontaneous activity. The next thing to talk about when thinking about a peripheral nerve is understanding that a mixed nerve trunk has a whole series of different fibres of different dimensions all doing different things. Evolutionary development of the peripheral nervous system is about conserving energy. So small fibres are not myelinated. These conduct slowly, intermittently, and are for homeostatic and regulation of internal environment. Slow pain, autonomic pseudomotor, and autonomic vasomotor function, allowing sweating and maintenance of peripheral vascular tone for temperature regulation and maintenance of blood pressure. The larger fibres conduct electricity frequently, and this is an energy expensive process. The cells have a large diameter, so they've got a high pooled reserve of ATP and also ions ready for the exchange to create the action potential. But in order to prevent having to waste ionic uh, conduction across the whole surface of the cell, the area of voltage-gated sodium channels and sodium potassium ATPases are concentrated at the nodes of rhombier, allowing a depolarization in the cleft to trigger depolarization in the next adjacent cleft. And this separation is achieved through the myelination. So the large cells you can see on the right are the myelinated fibres. These cells can only conduct when the cell axon is myelinated. And so a demyelination injury due to pressure, traction, or some form of injury to the nerve means that the axon is there, ready to conduct electricity, but cannot until it's remyelinated. And that process takes a couple of months. So when we're defining a nerve injury, if we see a patient who has preserved sweating and preserved vasomotor tone and preserved deep pressure awareness and C-fibre function, then those patients will normally have some degree of demyelinating neuropraxic injury and they'll have preservation of autonomic function so the whole nerve cannot be transected. This is termed neuropraxia. In a patient where every single fibre type is affected within the nerve, and indeed the hand is dry and red from vasodilatation, there's usually significant neuropathic pain, and this implies that all of the axons have been damaged equally throughout the nerve, and this therefore is more suggestive of an axonopathy, axonal disruption, or a neurontomesis. So these degenerative nerve lesions will have pain, They'll have a tunnel sign, so tapping at the site of injury produces tingling, paresthesia, and sometimes pain in the distribution of the affected nerve, and the skin will be dry from loss of the autonomic function. The recovery from any nerve injury um, can be dictated by this table. So for the neuropraxic injuries, which are the conduction blocks, ischemia, edema, and demyelination, recovery can be full within a few minutes, two weeks, the weeks requiring remyelination. Axonal injuries will have a tunnel. If the endoneural tube is intact, the recovery can be very rapid at two to four millimeters per day and surgery is usually not required. But when there's a more severe injury with some degree of damage internally within the nerve to the connective tissue structures, recovery is less complete 
at one millimetre per day, similar to that following nerve repair. Higher grades of injury with perineural disruption or complete transection of the nerve cannot recover without surgery. And surgical treatments can involve anything from decompression through to neurolysis with repair or reconstruction of gaps. The indications for surgery in the management of peripheral nerve injury are for diagnosis, to decompress a nerve that may be under duress, removing displaced fracture fragments. If there's a dislocation that's been delayed in its reduction, an open reduction should be effected to see and protect the nerves. If the patient develops dry skin or neuropathic pain, or if there's doubt, if the nerve is probably disrupted, there's ongoing deterioration whilst the patient is observed, or if there's a delay in the anticipated recovery, then all of these are indications for expiration of a nerve. How do we put this together? The first thing to think about is how we examine the brachial plexus. And what we're trying to determine is how many nerves have been injured, how many of the roots, how many of the cords. Where are they injured? Are they the supraclavicular injury? And is it a root avulsion or is it a rupture? Is it an infraclavicular injury, the cords or branch level or peripheral nerves? And what's the grade of that injury? Is it a conduction block, axonal injury, or neurontomesis? And some of these can coexist. And that's what makes it challenging. So what I do is I look very proximally on the upper proximal plexus. I look for the dorsal scapular nerve to the rhomboids and levator scapulae and the long thoracic nerves to the serratus anterior. If these are damaged and not working, it's very suggestive the C5 root may have been avulsed from the spinal cord. If they're working, then the injury may be more peripheral and a rupture may be a possibility. Next, I look at the T1 outflow. T1 supplies the sensory sympathetic innervation to the face, and this goes through the cervical ganglia. So if there's a T1 avulsion, there will be a Horner sign where there's a loss of sympathetic activity to the ipsilateral face with a partial ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis. So a Horner sign would be a suspicious feature of a very proximal T1 injury, therefore implying there may be an avulsion. So these are the two most important initial findings on the examination. So what we do is we look at the face, look for Horner's, we look at the attitude of the arm, is it a bad shoulder, good hand, bad hand uh, and bad shoulder, so a pan plexus injury, or is it a good shoulder and a bad hand, which would be a lower plexus injury. We want to know if there's muscle wasting, indicative of an axonal injury. Is there dry skin? What's the perfusion like? Because many brachial plexus injuries will have associated vascular injuries. We want to look at the range of motion. We use MRC for muscle grading. We look at sensation for sites of tunnel sign. And importantly, we look at the lower limbs. And I'll come on to this in just a moment. So the first things in the face are horner sign, as we've touched on. Meiosis and hydrosis, partial ptosis, a sign of loss of sympathetic innervation from the outflow at T1. We look at the attitude of the arm. In this patient, there's good shoulder and elbow function, but poor hand function with MCP extension. And this is a, a partial clawing uh, due to uh, injury to the medial cord and the medial head of the median nerve, following ligger clip application during trying to control a vascular hemorrhage following a stab in the anterior chest. We look to see if there's muscle wasting. This particular case is a patient who's woken up from proning on intensive care. You can see he's got poor finger flexion and wrist flexion. He's got wasting in the forearm, but he's also got very limited elbow flexion just from brachioradialis, and he's got a loss of his um, musculocutaneous nerve, but also his median nerve innervated muscles. We want to assess all motor function and every muscle should be graded using the MRC classification. Grade five normal, four, some power against resistance, three anti-gravity, two power with gravity eliminated, one flicker and zero nothing. So for instance, this patient who's got a C5-6 root injury has got excellent hand and wrist function, but is unable to abduct or externally rotate the shoulder and is unable to flex the elbow. So this is a C5-6 avulsion type injury to the brachial plexus. The muscles that are paralyzed are deltoid, supraspinatus, 
teres minor infraspinatus biceps brachialis brachioradialis as well as loss of the function to the sternal head of pectoralis subscap and teres major next we use tinel sign tinel sign is familiar to many for the examination of carpal tunnel but tinel sign is also a sign of injury to a peripheral nerve and tapping particularly at herbs point which is the junction of the c5 6 in the posterior triangle that can be um, present when there's axonal injury at that level or a rupture of the upper trunk. So it's important to ask the patient that when you tap and they elicit painful paresthesia, where do they feel the paresthesia? That gives some guide as to which nerves are injured. And it's possible to have false positives when tapping in the neck due to damage of the supraclavicular nerves. Um, so it's important to determine exactly where that sensation is perceived. If the patient experiences it in the neck and upper shoulder, that could be supraclavicular nerve. If they experience in the lateral elbow, that's C5, lateral forearm, C6, middle finger, C7, middle border of hand, C8, middle border of elbow, T1. Next, I look at long track signs in the lower limbs. I look for brisk reflexes or clonus. And the reason for this is that if you pull out a nerve out of the spinal cord, the avulsion injury, it can cause edema within the spinal cord and disrupt the inhibitory pathways down to the lower limbs. So it's very important to examine the lower limbs in the acute setting to try and determine could there be a preganglionic level injury. And the last thing I want to do is I want to examine all potential donor nerves and ensure they're strong enough. So as we've mentioned, the pitfalls, tapping in the neck for a tunnel sign, you can have a false positive with supraclavicular nerves. The other thing is that sometimes when an elderly, elderly patient has had a fracture or dislocation around the shoulder girdle, they may appear to have a complete loss of shoulder abduction and external rotation, but the injury is actually a peripheral one affecting the auxiliary nerve. And what you have is you've unmasked a pre-existing C5 innovated rotator cuff problem. So supraspinatus and infraspinatus may have had a cuff tear, not a neurological injury. Or they may have had an acute cuff tear because of the shoulder dislocation. So what's happened is the auxiliary nerve injury has either unmasked a pre-existing cuff arthropathy or there is a much more extensive shoulder joint injury plus an auxiliary nerve injury. And so it's important to image the rotator cuff with these infraclavicular plexus lesions. Next thing to discuss is the role of investigations. Thoroscopy of the chest is not something we use routinely but it can demonstrate an elevated di diaphragm from loss of the C345 phrenic nerve innervation. So remember, C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. CT myelography used to be involved putting a lumbar puncture in and putting the patient on a tilt table and looking to see whether or not there was an empty foramen. So you can see on the right-hand diagram that there's a root sitting um, outlined by some uh, contrast dye, but in the top root, there is an empty frame and sign, and this is a small pseudomeningocele. Now MRI is much better at picking this up, and you can see here a pseudomeningocele with an empty frame and sign with no spinal nerve root within it, and this is indicative of T1 avulsion. Neurophysiology causes a lot of concern for candidates in the exam. The important thing to say is that neurophysiology measures function in the peripheral nerve through sensory and motor conduction velocities. If you have a, an injury where you rupture a nerve proximally, due to Wallerian degeneration, all motor and sensory axons distally will be uh, degenerated through Wallerian degeneration. Therefore, you will have absent motor and sensory conduction velocities. However, in a situation where you avulse the nerve roots from the spinal cord, the cell body of the sensory nerve is still contained and alive within the dorsal root ganglion. And therefore, some of the peripheral axons for the sensory nerves may remain intact, although the patient cannot feel as there's no central connection. And this can be determined as intact sensory conduction velocity in the periphery with absent motor. And that's one of the hallmarks of a brachial plexus avulsion. The next thing is the role of electromy electromyography. Now this involves putting needles into the denervated muscles and sampling them. 
increased insertional activity, positive sharp waves and fibrillation without contraction under voluntary control and no motor unit potential on stimulating the main motor nerve trunk are all signs of a denervation. This can be used to determine the severity or extent of the injury, also to assess for recovery where we start to see positive sharp waves as muscles begin to reinnovate. Um, sorry, as we start to see polyphasic responses as muscles begin to reinnovate, and it can be used to monitor uh, recovery over time. It's also useful to assess the potential integrity of a donor nerve, which could be used for a transfer, which we'll talk about under brake complexes reconstruction. Now, reconstruction is extremely complex. The diagnostic pathway we've touched on already, we want to know the number of nerves injured, where they're injured and how badly. We may do investigations to support our diagnosis, but surgery is really the main aim in terms of affecting a diagnosis. It can allow us to see an avulsion or a rupture, rupture being amenable to direct repair with grafts, avulsions often requiring some other form of reconstruction, and it can also determine a continuity lesion that may or may not have conduction through it, and the decision needs to be made about whether an extra anatomical nerve transfer needs to be performed or whether that continuity lesion with a neuroma needs excising and reconstructing. We'll talk about the surgical priorities and what the immediate ones are. An early surgery also allows you to plan your secondary reconstruction and of course provide a prognosis for the patient, which is important to allow them to come to terms with these terrible uh, injuries, which can have lifelong implications. The benefits of early surgery are there's less scar. You can sometimes very rarely undertake a primary repair. Give that prognosis early and allow faster regeneration of nerves before apoptosis. And you can deal with associated injuries. Late surgery has a scarred bed, but conduction block injuries will have recovered. This may give more certainty about the reconstructive algorithm. A neuroma may be established, which can then be excised and reconstructed. Late surgery, unfortunately, in a nerve that needs reconstructing, has delayed the potential for that early reinnovation. And there's progressive motor end plate degeneration and pain issues can become mapped. So finding the balance for an individual patient is a challenge. But generally, the supraclavicular injuries are approached with more emergent surgery than the infraclavicular. Immediate re reconstruction or exploration should be undertaken in vascular injuries, this complex associated injuries such as clavicle fractures, and I find in iatropathic or iatrogenic injuries it's helpful to determine exactly what's going on and help resolve the pain, give the patient some sort of understanding of the source of the injury. Most brachioplex injuries are in the early days to week category. When their physiological condition improves, their associated injuries have been managed the nerve injury has been identified. Some of these patients are ventilated because of their associated injuries and therefore it's not picked up until days to weeks after injury. Late surgery is for those that weren't fit initially if the patient didn't make progress so there was an underestimation of the injury or a late referral. So early surgery involves decompression, very rarely direct repair. I'll illustrate one case. Most commonly nerve grafting or nerve transfers and then early surgery involves decompression, neurolysis, nerve grafting and transfers, and late surgery, nerve grafts and transfers, but also salvage procedures for arthrodesis, tendon transfers and functioning free muscle transfer. So there are a number of things in our toolbox, and we have to be able to be comfortable undertaking every one of these different procedures and understanding the relative indications and timing for each. So direct repair of, bra of a brachial plexus is seldom possible. The top pictures are those of a patient who was stabbed in the neck with a vascular injury and he went immediately to theatre and he had a transection of C8 and C1 and partial C7 and these were amenable to immediate repair. And the patient went on to get good extrinsic function in his forearm flexes but no significant intrinsic function in the hand being offered later some intrinsic uh, tendon transfer reconstruction for rebalancing of the hand. The lower pictures show the avulsion injury of the brachial plexus and clearly these roots cannot be implanted back into the spinal cord. The rootlets and the dorsal root ganglion are visible in the posterior triangle of the neck. The problem with nerve grafting is nerve grafting assumes that the nerve has been adequately debrided, that the proximal stump is healthy 
that motor and sensory axons will find their own way into critical functions distally? And if you've only got perhaps one route available, how do you target priority functions? Is there a risk of co-contraction, re-innovating agonists and antagonists? There's progressive cell death, particularly if these ruptured nerves are caught in scar. There's a risk of sensory motor mismatch. There's a long re-innovation distance down to the distal targets, so shoulder function may be possible to achieve, elbow function potentially, but anything beyond that is rather unpredictable. And there's also a loss of that afferent signaling, which is important for motor control. So nerve grafting also has limited donor nerve available. So in a complex injury, you might want to harvest both sural nerves and perhaps ipsilateral cutaneous nerves, the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, and radial nerve to reconstruct more important motor nerves. So let's give you some scenarios. An upper trunk injury, C5-6, with a rupture. This is amenable to debridement and grafting. Typically, C5 could be put into the suprascapular nerve with a cabled graft of sural nerve and a couple of cables into the posterior division of the upper trunk for shoulder function for deltoid and teres minor. C6 can be grafted into the anterior division of the upper trunk for elbow flexion, and this would hopefully achieve some function in biceps and brachialis. But if that nerve is avulsed, so C5 avulsion, we'll still have paralysis, but we don't have a graftable lesion. And C5-6 will also have paralysis of the shoulder and the elbow. And again, no reconstructive options by grafting. So we have to have something else in our toolbox. And of course, injuries can get more complex, where you may have hybrids between avulsions and ruptures. And it may be necessary in some of these situations to graft what you can, because you don't know how extensive the recovery will be. And so you need to be able to undertake grafts as well as some of the other reconstructions that we'll talk about, including nerve transfer. In this injury, with four roots avulsed and a rupture of C5, we only have one route available for grafting, and then we have potentially extra plexal donors from intercostal nerves and a spinal accessory nerve. And so generally early surgery, identifying this and targeting that into a critical function with a graft would be appropriate. This is another pamplexus injury, but is actually amenable to reconstruction. The neuroma and continuity that perhaps forms in the first six to eight weeks could be excised and grafted. C7 could be grafted, and then later tendon transfers or nerve transfers or a free muscle could be undertaken for the more distal function from the evolutions of C8 and C1. This, however, is the devastating injury complete loss of all of the nerve roots, the pan plexus injury due to root avulsions, and really nothing here can give useful function back. Um, anything we're doing is trying to provide some sort of platform for uh, assist function within the arm. Now I'm going to talk about nerve transfer surgery, and this is a critical subject matter to understand in detail. This has revolutionized the management of brachial plexus injuries. So nerve transfer uses an expendable motor branch from another nearby muscle that's live but can be expended and that can be rerouted into a more critical function. Fascicle transfer involves opening a nerve between its motor branch points, sacrificing a fascicle distally and swinging it out and using that to re-innovate a nearby muscle. Now what happens is there's partial denovation of a muscle downstream and that's because the innovation to that distal muscle is carried in a number of different fascicles within the nerve. And so you don't completely lose the function to a distal muscle. And then at the motor end plates, the innovator muscle fibers neurotropically attract side sprouting from intact axons within the intramuscular neural plexus. The motor unit increases in size and the donor function is regained. And now we have gained something for nothing. So the principle of nerve transfer is a live motor or sensory axon directed into the distal stump, um, which is the innovation to a muscle that could be a sensory re-innovation, is tension free and because it's close to the target there's rapid re -innovation. So just to demonstrate first nerve transfer, at the top of the picture is a live nerve with a muscle that's innovated in deep dark brown, then a more atrophic denovated muscle, um, a light brown colour at the bottom of the picture and if you section the motor innovation to the denovated muscle and separate the motor innovation distally to the innovator muscle and bring the two together with a tension-free coaptation. You denovate the muscle that's the donor 
and rapidly reinnovate the more important recipient function. Fascicle transfer is slightly different, but unfortunately, the, the terms are often used synonymously. Fascicle transfer involves opening a nerve proximal to a motor branch point. Now, you can see that when that nerve is open, the muscle partly denervates, but not completely. And that's because the innervation is carried in numerous fascicles that sector organize and eventually become that motor branch to that individual muscle. The live fascicle can then be used and transferred onto the denervated motor branch to the denervated target with a rapid renovation. And eventually what happens is the partly denervated donor becomes stronger once again. So nerve transfer is used in a number of situations. It can be the primary reconstructive option when there's an avulsion of a nerve. It can be used for non-reconstructable lesions such as fruit avulsions or severe long gaps where there's a poor surgical bed. For grafting, it can be combined with nerve grafts or tendon transfers and what we term a hybrid reconstruction. So you might elect to do a nerve transfer for a critical fun function and graft for pain and other less critical functions. You can use it for salvage, particularly where you've done some early surgery, the patient's presented late um, or the patient isn't recovering as you would expect or you have a challenge with too little autologous graft available. So it works broadly on these principles. There is the sector organization of the brachial plexus. You can see here that there's innovation from C5 and 6 to the shoulder, deltoid, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, biceps brachialis, brachioradialis, and the lower plexus is supplied through C8, T1. So when there's an injury up in the brachial plexus, you'll have some muscles, such as those from C5, 6, which are denervated, but with intact function in nerves flowing past them and it's these nerves can then be used as donors to re those more proximal muscles. Now it can work in reverse but unfortunately the donor nerves from C5-6 innovated into the lower plexus have a long way to re, -re so it goes against some of the basic principles of nerve transfer which is shortening the distance to re for a fast recovery. So let's look at it in practice. In a C5 injury, there's loss of suprascapular nerve and loss of deltoid, so there's no shoulder abduction or external rotation. Shoulder function is significantly impaired. In such cases, the treatment options that are available include the nerve transfer from the spinal accessory nerve, populated by Suzuki et al. in 1972, and this involved taking the lateral branch of the spinal accessory nerve in the posterior triangle at the time of neck expiration and transferring it onto the suprascapular nerve if the C5 root had been avulsed or there was a C5-6 avulsion injury. The problem with this is it can weaken the lateral trapezius, which is important for elevation of the shoulder girdle in the otherwise paralyzed shoulder. And my belief is it can miss an injury of the suprascapular nerve further distally where the suprascapular nerve passes through the suprascapular notch, and this can explain some of the poor functional outcomes. So the lateral branch of the spinal accessory nerve supplies lateral trapezius, which is a critical function. The suprascapular nerve may be injured further down its course, and there's a possibility of entrapment of the nerve during regeneration anyway at this site. If you look at the critical results, you find that many patients have no significant external rotation recovery and poor abduction when this is used in isolation, and this needs to be improved. Our own work on this has looked at the anatomy of the suprascapular nerve as it passes through the notch. And what we now do is a posterior approach and we decompress the suprascapular nerve at the notch. We identify if there's a rupture or a neuroma, and then we bypass this using the medial spinal accessory branch, transfer distal to the suprascapular notch onto the suprascapular nerve. Our own experience is with these posterior expirations, we've identified high right rates of concomitant injury to the nerve at the notch and therefore this is now our preferred technique. The approach is challenging. It splits trapezius above the uh, scapular uh, spine. All of these techniques are available on the orthorical website or as cadaveric dissections on my YouTube channel. Uh, the spinal accessory medial branch is highlighted in the white sloop. Following decompression of the suprascapular nerve, it's removed from the notch and rotated superficially and medially to meet the distally sectioned medial branch of the spinal accessory nerve for direct coaptation.
and the results for this are much better in terms of external rotation and also for shoulder abduction and now it's become our default method of reconstruction for these highly complex injuries. We also mentioned that with a C5 injury there was also loss of the auxiliary nerve and one of my friends Somsat Li Chava um, in 2003 he undertook a nerve transfer from the triceps and rotated this up over the teres major and anastomosis onto the anterior division of the auxiliary nerve. So this revolutionized the management of the shoulder, giving two muscles now, spinal accessory to deltoid, sorry, spinal accessory to suprascapular nerve and triceps to deltoid, giving a much better chance of meaningful abduction. And he presented this case series and this has now become a widespread adopted technique. So the nerve actually now re-innovates, instead of one of the triceps heads, he used the long head, it now re-innovates the anterior division of the auxiliary nerve. Very useful, meaningful shoulder abduction is achieved. In the early phase, the patient needs to activate their triceps in order to affect powerful shoulder abduction. But over time, this separates out the function and the patient can improve even with the triceps deactivated with elbow flexion. Now, Susan McKinnon talked about a combined posterior approach to undertake a medial triceps transfer into deltoid and also the medial spinal accessory to the suprascapular nerve. Um, this was done with a patient in the prone position and she reported this as having some advantages over the traditional techniques. If we go back in time, Adolf Stoffel, a German surgeon from Mannheim, described in a textbook contemporary in 1911, published in 1913, that the anatomy and the branching anatomy of the deltoid and teres minor was such that the upper lateral cutaneous nerve came off the posterior division of the auxiliary nerve and it's possible therefore to re-innovate the auxiliary nerve and re-innovate teres minor posterior deltoid anterior deltoid and the skin and of course these axons re-innovating from the motor triceps would be lost and he indeed described the triceps to auxiliary nerve transfer done through an anterior approach through the axilla and this was the technique um, described again by Jaime Patelli from Brazil um, early in the um, in this century. So Stoffel obviously had an awareness of the branching anatomy and the critical innovation of the posterior deltoid and the teres minor. And so I've actually built on this original work and if you look at this patient, this patient has had a medial spinal accessory transfer. As you can see, they're too early to have yet overcome their sulcus sign. But actually as they activate their, um, as their long head of triceps, the shoulder relocates. And this is a sign that the long head of triceps is a really important function in terms of keeping the shoulder stable in an otherwise um, severe C5 or C5-6 injury. So I, I personally don't think the long head of tricep should be denovated. It attaches above the shoulder onto the glenoid and as such it's critical to maintain that function to stabilize the shoulder joint. So I use the medial head of triceps, I rotate it upwards and I attach it onto the auxiliary nerve both anterior and posterior divisions. There are usually two fascicle groups within the medial head and both can be taken. As an aside, if you want to see this technique, please check out the website or Thoracle. I'm one of the editors, and this is one of my techniques. Every step of the operation is broken down. Here it was combined with a spinal accessory to suprascapular nerve, but you can see here the approach for the triceps medial branch into the auxiliary nerve with a lazy S incision following the posterior border of deltoid down to the posterior aspect of the midline of the upper arm. The fat's dissected, the cutaneous branch is identified, the upper lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm. This is traced through the deep fascia to then identify the deep anatomy. It's possible to actually palpate the auxiliary nerve. It usually lies five centimeters distal to the lateral edge of the acromion, and it can be rolled on the undersurface of the deltoid. And here's the anterior division of the auxiliary nerve with the upper lateral cutaneous nerve in the blue sloop. Yellow sloop tags the anterior division of the auxiliary nerve and then with gentle retraction it's possible to trace 
back to the quadrilateral space and find the rest of the auxiliary node for the posterior division, which is then in the red sloop. Next, the interval between the medial head, sorry, between the long head and lateral head of triceps is open to identify the radial nerve deep to teres major. This is dissected and a superficial fascicle identified and tagged and traced distally to muscle after stimulation, confirming that it's actually the medial triceps branch. This is then sectioned distally, a little bit of intraneural dissection first, just to allow it to rotate in a tension-free fashion proximally. The length here, and particularly the fact that it's got two main fascicle groups, means we can target the anterior division of the auxiliary nerve, and separately the posterior division of the auxiliary nerve just distal to the takeoff of the upper lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, so we innovate just posterior deltoid and teres minor. And this is my preferred modification of the technique. Any trimming that needs to be done can be done off the distal stump to shorten the reinnovation phase, and then the anastomosis that is done under the operating microscope using microsurgical sutures augmented with tissue fibrin glue, and the wound is closed. Now the operative techniques talk about the rehabilitation. We have our own six phase rehabilitation pathway for motor nerve transfer in Birmingham, and you're welcome to use it in your own patients. Um, and it also describes all of the evidence. So it's a very useful resource for these complex procedures. Next, let's talk about a patient with a C5-6 injury. If C5 and C6 are both injured, then obviously there's a loss of the suprascapular nerve and also the auxiliary nerve as previously mentioned, but also now a critical loss of the musculocutaneous nerve. So there's no elbow flexion. Christophe Oberlin is a Parisian surgeon who described a technique taking a fascicle from the intact ulnar nerve in the medial upper part of the upper arm and rotating this to innovate the motor branch to biceps. This gained popularity and has revolutionized not only adult but also pediatric or obstetric brachial plexus injuries. And it gives much improved grade of elbow flexion over traditional techniques such as spinal accessory nerve transfer or intercostal nerve transfer or even grafting. It can be combined with a second fascicle from the median nerve as long as C7 is intact and this can be innovated into the motor branch to brachialis to give more robust elbow flexion. For those of you that want to learn more about the techniques, please see Orthoracle. Also on my nerve surgery channel on YouTube, there are cadaveric dissections showing every individual stage of the procedure, how to identify the nerves and how to undertake the transfer in a tension-free manner. It's a very useful procedure. Here you can see with gravity eliminated, there's early restoration of elbow flexion with flickers into biceps starting just as early as three months. Anti-gravity is limited, but can be augmented by recruiting the ulnar nerve. This case illustrates the challenge in neuroplasticity. With the ulnar nerve recruited, elbow flexion is strong. As long as the ulnar nerve activation is maintained, the elbow can be flexed. Once the ulnar nerve is deactivated, the patient is unable to flex her elbow. This will strengthen with time, but this is why a specialist rehabilitation um, program is necessary to optimize the outcome from these nerve transfers. What about the evidence? So we're talking about C5 and C5-6 injuries. Well, if you do a double nerve transfer, you get better elbow flexion than with a single nerve transfer. Uh, more patients get M4 power, about 88%. And in fact, this can be better than grafting the upper trunk or the musculocutaneous nerve. So two nerve transfers are better than one, um, but there is a marginal benefit. When we look at shoulder abduction, a double nerve transfer for shoulder abduction, and even in this case, a lateral branch spinal accessory to the suprascapular nerve and a long head transfer to the anterior division of the auxiliary nerve, um, it shows almost double the patients are getting um, better power, grade 4 or grade 4 plus power of shoulder abduction. External rotation uh, is poorly documented in most series, um, but you can see using the technique, again, significant improvement in external rotation, but it's still nowhere near the types of figures we would be seeing for shoulder abduction or for elbow flexion. And so this is where we think things can be improved. And if you look at the range of motion, shoulder abduction range of motion about 122 degrees, with a double nerve transfer and shoulder external rotation about 108 degrees, but the numbers are very small here. So we've developed a protocol to try and deal with these problems, to try and improve the shoulder abduction range of motion and strength, and to improve specifically the shoulder external rotation range of motion and strength.
We now explore the suprascapular nerve at the notch posteriorly, decompress it. We use the medial spinal accessory branch, as I've shown you. We also leave the long head of triceps to stabilize the shoulder and transfer the medial head of triceps to the anterior and posterior divisions of the axillary nerve. And that's to re both deltoid and teres minor. And where possible, we do a double fascicle transfer for elbow flexion. And if you check out the Journal of Musculoskeletal Surgery and Research in 2019, uh, my algorithm is um, listed there to go with a separate paper on the rehabilitation. So this is a graphic we use to show our patients. Uh, the spinal accessory nerve has got medial and lateral branches and the suprascapular nerve is non-functioning. What we would do is we would expose it at the notch. We would identify and stimulate and confirm that it's not working with a C5 injury. So we've got loss of supraspinatus and infraspinatus. We would then section it. We would then take the medial spinal accessory branch and transfer this with a direct coaptation, tension-free distal to the notch. And this gives very rapid re of supraspinatus and reliable re of infraspinatus, although it is not possible to exclude an injury to the infragenicular, infraspinous branch of the um, suprascapular nerve, which can also be injured at the spinal glenoid notch. The second um, procedure we've spoken about is the medial triceps. What we do is we take the medial triceps branch and we take that out below the teres major, we rotate it up over teres major, and we transfer it onto the auxiliary nerve to try and re the anterior posterior divisions and teres minor. So we get deltoid and teres minor, and we omit the fascicle groups that would go to the upper lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, as this would be a waste of our regenerating motor axons. So these two techniques combined give us very reliable restoration of shoulder abduction and exhale rotation and preserve the function in the long head of triceps, which is a shoulder stabiliser. What about our results? Well, in the patients with sufficient follow-up, we've got 100% of our patients have shoulder abduction grade 4, 81% grade 4 um, external rotation. Shoulder abduction range is good, even though our patients have complex shoulder injuries, and external rotation 105 degrees, comparable with Garg's paper. So it's showing that we're improving the range of motion into abduction and we're improving the number of patients and the range having useful external rotation. This is despite complex shoulder injuries. So if you look at the external rotation, um, we're about 105 degrees compared to the pooled GARG paper um, over 108 degrees. Um, and it's probable representative of some of the complexity of our shoulder injuries. And push down, push down. And, and relax. And push down, push down. And, and relax. So this demonstrates that there is preservation of the innovation to the long head of triceps, which stabilizes the shoulder. And this is one of the pre-op findings, but after surgery, that's also maintained. The benefits of this procedure, we can identify an injury to the suprascapular nerve. We can de decompress the regenerating suprascapular nerve. We bring our nerve transfer closer to the targets. We preserve the spinal accessory function to the lateral trapezius. We re the whole of the auxiliary nerve, preserve the long head of triceps. And I believe we get improved power of shoulder abduction and external rotation and improved range of motion of external rotation. When C7 is also involved, it's much more challenging. The reason being is we'll have some loss of elbow extension, meaning triceps needs restoration and we can't use that for deltoid. We've also got uh, weakness of FCR, so we can't use that for a double nerve transfer from both ulnar and median nerves to biceps and brachialis. Um, now, if there was an injury with ruptures, then of course you could graft these, and that would be a sensible early approach using nerve transfers for non-recovery. But more often than not, there's an avulsion. If there was an avulsion and a rupture, the rupture could be grafted. Um, and so we would throw in nerve grafting, if possible, in these more complex injuries, as we are uncertain about the options available to us in terms of nerve transfer, depending on further local recovery and grades of injury in the adjacent nerves, particularly our donors. So with these C567 injuries, particularly these three root avulsions, the challenge is to restore meaningful shoulder function and elbow function and the only donor nerves that we now have available include um, the 
spinal accessory nerve, intraplexal donors for elbow flexion. Uh, we may need to start thinking about using the medial pectoral nerve, intercostal nerves, just because the uh, extent of the injury is more complex. Intercostal nerves can be used for triceps. If there's a lower plexus injury, so C8, T1 injured, but everything else is working reasonably well, the functional loss is hand intrinsic as well as long finger flexion and extension. Even if you had a rupture, grafting the nerves in the neck is unlikely to achieve useful meaningful function downstream because of the distances involved. And most of these are avulsion injuries based on Maracas's rule of sevens. In these patients, reconstruction can be done with nerve transfers or tendon transfers. Early nerve transfers would need to be done because the donor nerves from the C5, 6 and 7 innervated muscles are more proximally located in the arm and the denervated targets are more distal. And so the reinnervation distance for a nerve transfer is longer, hence it needs to be done earlier. This is why it's a very good idea to explore ne the neck early or use adjunctive imaging such as MRI to confirm the C8 T1 avulsions. Now the available donors for us include the supinator branches through the posteriorteous nerve. Supination is supplied by C5-6, and the rest of the posterior interosseous nerve for finger and thumb extension is from C8. Because the C8 is avulsed, the fingers and thumb aren't extending, but the supinator branches are live and locally available, and these can be used to renovate the posterior interosseous nerve. We can also preserve supination because biceps has a supinator action. We can take a nerve to brachialis, and we can use that to re-innovate the anterior interosseous nerve for thumb function and for bend within the index and middle finger. I've changed this technique a little bit and my own technique involves re sensory nerves as well as motor nerves, but for the motor nerves I tend to put brachialis into the ulnar nerve, ECRB into the anterior interosseous nerve and supinate into the posterior interosseous nerve including ECU to stabilise the wrist. And then the sensory nerve transfers include lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm into medial cutaneous nerve of forearm, palmar branch median nerve to dorsal branch of ulnar nerve, and a web space transfer, um, usually um, median to ulna, to try and innovate the ulnar border of the hand. So looking at the C8-T1 injury, there's a loss of finger flexion, loss of median and ulnar nerve function. The brachialis nerve can be harvested in the upper arm after the musculocutaneous nerve has innervated biceps, it then splits into two. One is the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, and one is the nerve to brachialis. This can then be transferred into the fascicle group if the median nerve for anti interosseous nerve function. And it gives pretty useful function, but the re time is quite long uh, six months before anything's noticed, and 12 months before it's useful, meaningful flexion. And you can see that the patient has flexion that's much better on the radial side of the hand, and this is because of the anti interosseous nerve innervation. We combine it with a supinator to posterior interosseous nerve transfer. So what we do is we take the supinator branches and we transfer them in to the posterior interosseous nerve. Supinator, as I've said before, is C5-6 and is working. Posterior interosseous nerve is non-functional. This transfer allows reliable finger extension, very effective, and it re well within six months and is extremely strong by 12 months. Sometimes, because of the poor function of FCU and ECU, the wrist can become unbalanced into radial deviation, and patients don't like this. Other options are tenodesis of the ECU, or even a wrist fusion. A wrist fusion then frees up a tendon. ECRL can be used for something more meaningful, perhaps to augment finger flexion. This case illustrates the radial deviation of the wrist, which is apparent um, from someone who's had these reconstructions uh, in a C8-T1 lesion. And this is because they do not have the um, function within the EC or the FCU. And so the wrist actually comes into radial deviation on extension. You can see there's useful functional restoration of finger flexion, finger extension, and key pinch grip using the reconstructions that I've mentioned so these are the spin transfer and the brain transfer. Now, a summary of partial plexus injury. 
Early surgery defines the injury, provides a prognosis, and allows you to plan reconstruction. Consider nerve grafting for ruptures, particularly if there are multiple root injuries, and it may not be possible to do your standard reconstructive techniques for uh, nerve transfer. With a bad shoulder and good hand, consider double nerve transfers where possible. Consider the posterior approach spinal accessory to suprascapular nerve. Medial triceps to the whole of the axillary nerve, sparing the long head of triceps, and a double fascicle transfer from the median and ulnar nerves into biceps and brachialis. For a good shoulder, bad hand, consider supinator branches to posterior entrosis nerve, brachialis branches to anterior entrosis nerve. There isn't currently a nerve transfer available for intrinsic restoration, and once the long finger flexor and extension strength improves, the hand may begin to claw and a static anti-claw procedure might be required. If the wrist is stabilized with a fusion, then there are other tendon transfers available for intrinsic function. The pan plexus injury is much more challenging. You have a flail arm with a bad shoulder and a bad hand, and there are no really good reconstructive options. We would graft anything we possibly could, We'd consider fusing the shoulder so that we wouldn't have to expend any nerve reconstruction for shoulder function. We could concentrate then on elbow flexion and extension, but there are different strategies that can be employed. With a useful elbow flexion and extension and a stable shoulder, the biceps tendon can be detached and placed into the finger flexes with a fasciolata graft with a wrist fusion, and this can give a tenodesis grip with release by activating triceps. Elbow flexion can be maintained through the Lacertus fibrosis. It is possible to just concentrate on shoulder function and break your thoracic pinch, and this may be more meaningful or useful for some patients. But attempts at trying to get active finger flexion using nerve transfers or contralateral C7 transfer are unpredictable, and often free muscle transfers are brought in uh, because they're long, they can be used to gain a function distal in the arm with proximal nerve renovation, and I'll show how they work. For these sort of injuries, we do need extra flexile donors. Spinal accessory is critical, as are intercostal nerves, and sometimes contralateral C7. The phrenic nerve has been used, but um, is not something we use in our current um, algorithm. So the pan plexus injury can involve five root avulsions. If there was a root available, then of course this could be used for grafting, and this would be an extremely good scenario, with potential grafts available for C5, 6, and 7 after the resection of that upper trunk neuroma. That would restore shoulder and elbow function. Um, a free muscle could then be done for finger flexion. So the functional loss is everything. Bad shoulder, bad elbow, bad hand. Some of the reconstructive options we consider include taking the spinal accessory nerve and using this with a nasural nerve graft onto the motor branch to biceps. We'd be fusing the shoulder later. This would allow us to get a stable shoulder um, once we've done any free muscle transfers. And before the muscles start to activate, uh, which would result in pistoning and instability of the shoulder. So this spinal accessory is really important for elbow flexion. But you can preserve it and you can use it for a free muscle. And a free muscle can do two things. It can actually flex the elbow and it can flex the fingers. And a double free muscle can achieve elbow flexion and wrist extension and finger flexion. And one could be powered off the spinal accessory and one off intercostals. But there are different strategies that include wrist fusion and a single free muscle transfer. And intercostal nerves can also be used onto triceps to try and give some antagonistic function. Intercostal nerves are usually harvested uh, from the ch anterior chest wall through an oblique or a longitudinal incision. They're dissected back very carefully. The motor intercostals are then reflected towards the axilla. They can be brought together with to seal using a microsurgery background to intubulate them, and they can be anastomosed. In this case, it's onto the motor branch, the biceps. Contralateral C7 is controversial. What happens is the C7 nerve root from the normal arm is harvested, either in its entirety, distally, or it's split and uh, into its anteromedial and postralateral components. And one component is taken, and this can be taken distally and rotated uh, towards the damaged, uh, denervated arm. This provides a useful source of donor axons. Uh, these can actually be used to renovate um, finger flexion. And the way this was done originally was to take the ulnar nerve out of the denervated arm, reverse it on a vascular pedicle above the elbow, 
sectioning it proximally and distally. And this islanded flap of ulnar nerve can then be used to have a reversed conduit from nerves from C7 across the front of the shoulder and then placed into the median nerve of the denervated forearm. But meaningful power of finger flexion is really only achieved in about 28% of patients. Um, and it can be then used as a source of axons for a free muscle for finger flexion. But I think functionally it doesn't achieve uh, a great deal. And it is possible also to do this without going into the neck by doing a cross pec nerve transfer um, using the medial pectoral nerve or the lateral pectoral nerve. Functionally free muscles are designed to improve either elbow bend or elbow bend and finger bend. Um, and usually the gracilis is taken. It's got a nice uh, pedicle, a long donor nerve from the obturator. And this can be anastomosed either onto intercostal nerves or onto, or onto the spinal accessory nerve. Coupled with a shoulder fusion to stabilize the shoulder, here intercostals are innovating a free muscle for elbow flexion and it can give useful power. In this case, it was an assist arm. So for a pan plexus injury, there's a flail arm with a bad shoulder and bad hand. It's about prioritizing function and really with a five root avulsion, there's very little that can be done. Our current strategy is uh, restoring biceps and triceps function, stabilizing the shoulder with a fusion, and then trying to gain some finger flexion with um, a free muscle. Um, but this needs to be tailored for the individual patient. There's very limited functional potential. Surgery also has a role in reducing pain by restoring some function. Very important to diagnose these patients early so that all reconstructive options are available. And if there are graftable lesions, then go ahead and graft these as they may give some useful um, adjunctive function other than what can be achieved through our standard reconstructive regimens. But really fusion, arthrodesis, uh, free muscles, these salvage procedures are needed in such difficult cases. Infraclavicular injuries, as we mentioned before, um, generally have various patterns and if there's an associated vascular injury or fracture, then these may dictate the timing of surgery. But for many of the lower grade injuries associated with shoulder dislocation, there's an expectant policy and intervention with neurolysis and nerve transfer uh, is necessary if the patients aren't progressing. Occasionally patients have a rupture which needs surgery and usually these are um, troubled by severe pain. So early surgery for those with displaced fractures requiring treatment, um, reduction of persistent dislocations or very high energy injuries, open injuries. Um, but in all cases, we should talk about pain. Any nerve injury results in pain and the neural pathway connects the periphery with the brain, the brainstem. A nociceptive stimulation through the reflex pathway allows withdrawal through the spinal monosynaptic reflex. But the central connections increase awareness and allow the brain to localize the pain response. When the afferent signaling is lost, patients will have persistent pain, amplification and modulation of pain at the spinal cord, but also phantom pain can develop or neuropathic pain because of um, increased awareness within the brain, listening harder due to that loss of afferent signaling. So patients will have deafferentation, they also sometimes have mechanical pain dragging on the nerves, what we term neurostenalgia from tether, they may have neuroma pain, which can be spontaneous or evoked when the area is knocked or injured. There are huge psychosocial and financial ramifications with these complex nerve injuries with relationship strain, loss of um, identity, a loss of financial independence and support networks, uh, depression and anxiety. Uh, an important role of what we do as clinicians is education, providing multi-professional support. We can use pharmacological and electrical neuromodulation, uh, but where possible, functional restoration, even using targeted muscle renovation, orthotics, uh, functioning free muscles, can all benefit by giving some normal function or surrogate function, which can downregulate some of the pain pathways. It's important that we allow the patient to return to some form of independence and allow them to access peer support. And there are some very useful peer support groups in the UK. No nerve transfer will work unless the patient is rehabilitated well. We have a six phase rehabilitation pathway in Birmingham and it's known as the PEAS, a preoperative phase where we're strengthening the donor, educating the patient and trying to prevent joint stiffness and trophic changes. A phase following the nerve transfer where we protect the limb undertaking isometric exercises. 
a prevention phase, which is to try and mobilize stiff joints, uh, allow neural glide, a power phase where we're trying to activate the recipient by activating the donor, a plasticity phase where we're trying to separate out the two functions, and then finally a phase where we try and tailor function for the individual, uh, which, which we term purpose. Now any paralysis can be restored if there are tendons available with sufficient power through tendon transfer. And tendon transfer can be done at any stage, but you're redirecting a donor muscle, you change the sarcomere length as soon as you actually do a tenotomy, and you may alter the vector of pull, there may be a mismatch in amplitude or phase between the donor and recipient, and the tendons may not glide because of scar. You need to protect it, and although there's rapid re you are losing the donor muscle function. And it's usually only possible to get a single function back with one tendon transfer. Nerve transfer needs to be done earlier, particularly for low motor neuron conditions. It's different for spinal cord injury. The original muscle is re-innovated, so there's no change to the resting length of the sarcomere. There's less scarring. The nerve transfer is surgically performed near the motor branch, not where the muscle or tendon glides. It doesn't require protection for any length of time, but there's a much slower rehabilitation. And it's possible to res reserve and restore the uh, donor function through using fascicle transfer. And sometimes one nerve transfer can give more than one function, such as a nerve transfer to the suprascapular nerve can re both supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Nerve transfer performed proximally onto the musculocutaneous nerve can re biceps and brachialis. And similarly, nerve transfer onto the auxiliary nerve can restore teres minor and deltoid. And if we compare the outcome of nerve transfer versus tendon transfer, for shoulder abduction and external rotation, I think nerve transfers offer a superior result. Even for elbow flexion, I think also for digital extension, the supinated to posterior trosses nerve transfer really provides excellent results for patients maintaining digit flexibility. Um, I'm not so sure about um, function in high radial palsies. I think in high radial palsies with wrist extension, I think the power of wrist extension to affect a really good tenodesis is better achieved with tendon transfers. But this is a, an area of debate at the moment in peripheral nerve surgery. So this is a complex subject matter. It's a very extensive talk. And this talk goes across the basic principles, but also some of the detail for those that are interested. The important thing to take home is brachial plexus injuries are complex, high energy injuries often associated with motorcycles. There are usually multiple other injuries which take priority, but early discussion with a plexus surgeon can allow early planning of surgical inter intervention, particularly for the supraclavicular lesion. The role of the nerve surgery team is to manage expectations, educate the patient and help managing pain. Early surgery for the supraclavicular with tailored functional um, reconstruction and if you have an isolated C5 or C5-6 injury the results really from reconstruction are excellent and it would be disappointed not if we couldn't achieve useful arm function. Um, for lower plexus injury C8-T1 hand function is more limited but again as you've seen it's possible to restore useful function but most of these patients will have some degree of lifelong pain and functional impairment particularly when there are all five nerve roots involved and then the reconstructive aims are far more limited. Um, you may find of interest some of the references that I've quoted in this paper. There was a special edition of the Journal of Musculoskeletal Surgery and Research that I guest edited, and we wrote a few of the articles that are featured here. It's open access, freely available uh, from the website, and it was published in January 2019. And for more information or clinical advice, contact us through the Nerve Clinic, um, the Nerve Surgeon, um, also provides information and educational resources and follow us on Twitter or Instagram and some of the operative features uh, op operative procedures featured are also on the orthorical website and the YouTube nerve surgery channel um, if you want to see some of those cataract dissections many thanks for listening um, 